you imagine a blood bank without pre-transfusion testing? How would we ever deliver compatible blood products? Hi, I'm Dr. Hermelin. Join me in the blood bank to learn about pre-transfusion testing, the fundamental testing performed to identify the patient's blood type and selecting a compatible blood product for safe transfusion. Let's get started. I'd like to start by putting pre-transfusion testing into perspective for you. I want you to imagine that is the year 1899, and we're one year away from Dr. Carl Landsteiner discovering the ABO blood group system. We certainly don't have pre-transfusion testing. In fact, we don't even have a blood bank yet. So what are the chances that we can provide a compatible unit of blood to a person requiring a transfusion? What are the chances if we took two random people one donor and one recipient that we could provide a compatible transfusion and avoid an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. Would it be 5% chance, 50% chance, 90% chance that we could provide a compatible blood product? The chances of providing a compatible transfusion depend on the prevalence of the ABO blood group antigens within a population. And in St. Louis, which is where I'm living, there would be a 66% chance of providing a compatible unit of blood through random selection. Now let's move forward to the year 2020. The chances of providing a compatible unit of blood with pre-transfusion testing, which means knowing the patient's ABO blood type and selecting a product that matches, raises compatibility to 99%. Now you're starting to see how important pre-transfusion testing is for compatibility. Let's shift our gear and really focus on the ABO blood group system. Dr. Carl Landsteiner, considered the father of transfusion medicine, actually discovered the ABO blood group system in the year 1900 and 1901. In fact, he received the Nobel Prize for his discovery in 1930. ABO system contains four major ABO phenotypes, A, B, AB, and O. The four phenotypes are determined by the presence or absence of two antigens on the red blood cells. ABO antigens are inherited by a gene located on chromosome 9 that encodes for an enzyme known as a glycosyltransferase that extends a sugar group on the H antigen, the precursor for both the A and B antigens. In group O individuals, neither A or B antigens are synthesized as a result of a mutation of the ABO gene. Whereas in group AB individuals, both A and B carbohydrates are synthesized. These antigens are detected on red cells of embryos as early as five to six weeks of gestation. Adult levels of ABO expression are present by two to four years of age. Another very important element on the ABO system is the presence or absence of naturally occurring antibodies, called isohemagglutinins, that are made against the A or B antigens a person does not express. Naturally occurring antibody refers to the fact that these antibodies do not require being exposed to the antigen through blood exposure such as in transfusion or pregnancy, but are believed to form naturally from exposure to gut bacteria that have ABO-like structure on their bacterial surfaces. We can see newborns begin to show isohemagglutinins around three to six months of age and fully express them about one years old. I want you to notice that the IgM is the predominant isotype found in group A and group B individuals with small amounts of IgG. These antibodies can activate and drive complement at 37 degrees leading to intravascular hemolysis. This is the dreaded complication that we want to avoid, and therefore, identifying the patient's blood type and providing a compatible unit is fundamental. Let's take a minute and summarize these key points. Number one, a person can inherit a specific ABO phenotype known as the major blood group antigens. Number two, naturally occurring antibodies are formed against antigens that are not expressed. And number three, these antigens are of the IgM isotype and combine to red blood cell antigens driving complement-mediated intravascular hemolysis. 
So now that you have a nice understanding of the ABO blood group system, let's move forward and actually talk about the pretransfusion timeline and pretransfusion testing. And notice how pretransfusion testing can be divided into three parts. The first part is when we receive the patient's pretransfusion sample to correctly identify and confirm the patient's blood group and their RHD type as well as identify any unexpected non-ABO blood group antigens. This portion of testing is called the type and screen, and we're gonna focus on that in just a bit. Once we identify the patient's blood type, we then select a donor red blood cell unit, perform a cross match, which can be either serologic or electronic, and then finally label the blood component with the recipient's information. This is all the testing that's performed in the blood bank from the time we receive a pretransfusion sample to the time that we get that blood out the door to be transfused to the patient. So I'm sure you're asking, well, how long does all of this take? Well, the answer is it depends. The entire process could be completed within a few hours. However, delays can occur if there are issues with the patient's sample, such as a typing discrepancy or we find unexpected antibodies requiring further testing. We're about to jump into the type and screen, but before we do so, I want to take a second and talk about the importance of a properly labeled pretransfusion specimen. It's imperative that we pro provide the right patient the right blood at the right time. So our specimens have a high criteria for being labeled properly. It requires that the specimen is labeled before leaving the patient's bedside. It has two nurse's initials. It has two independent patient identifiers, such as the medical record number, the name, the date of birth. And also we require that it has the date of collection. And you'll see shortly that we're going to talk about how long a pretransfusion sample is good for. And the date of collection is really important. All right, congratulations, you have made it to the best part of the video. We're now gonna delve into the actual testing that we do in the blood bank, and we're gonna focus today on the type and screen. We're gonna first talk about the type portion of the type and screen. So as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna always be toggling back and forth between what's on the red blood cells and what's in the patient's plasma. The type is actually divided into two different portions, the front or forward type, and the reverse or back type. The front type is looking at what ABO antigens are being expressed on the patient's red blood cells. The reverse type is looking at what antibodies are in the patient's plasma. Now the front and reverse type are performed together and should correlate with each other at the time of testing. Let's now take a look at this testing up close. This pre-transfusion specimen is being done on Miss S, a 56-year-old woman who is scheduled for a liver transplant. She is blood type A positive. First, we remove some red blood cells and place it into a test tube so that we can make a red blood cell dilution. Next, we take the plasma portion and add that to two test tubes. Next, we collect our reagents, anti-A, anti-B, and anti-D antibodies, as well as A and B red blood cells. Now we're gonna start the front type. We're gonna add anti-A and anti-B antibody to our patient's red blood cell suspensions. We also add anti-D antibody to look for the D antigen in our patient. Now let's look at the reverse type. Here we take reagent red blood cells that are type A and type B, adding a drop of each one to the patient's plasma. Next, we're going to take our test tubes, put them in a centrifuge, and spin them for 15 seconds. Afterwards, we will look for agglutination. While things are spinning, I want you to be thinking about what type of reactivity we might see in the test tubes since the patient's A positive. Now that it's completed, let's take a look at the results. A positive reaction is one in which we see agglutination, or red blood cells sticking together and forming a button. 
The first test tube is bluish in color, and it's the one in which anti-A1 antibody is added to the patient's red blood cells. And remember, she's A positive, meaning she carries the A antigen, and the A1 antibody will bind to it, agglutinating and leading to the formation of a button. The second test tube is negative because the anti-B antibody was added to patient's red blood cells that are negative for the B antigen. The third test tube was the one in which we added the anti-D antibody, and since the patient carries the D antigen, it agglutinated or stuck together and formed a button. Therefore, the forward portion of this test shows that she is A positive. This is the reverse portion of the screen. I want you to notice that the patient's second test tube is positive, and that's because that's where Donor B red blood cells were added to the patient's plasma, and she has naturally occurring anti-B antibodies, which will bind to the B red blood cells and agglutinate. The forward and reverse show no typing discrepancies. Therefore, we can now call the patient safely an A positive. Now the screen is the portion of pre-transfusion testing in which we are going to be identifying any unexpected antibodies in the patient's plasma. Now I say unexpected because in the ABO blood group system, we expect naturally occurring anti-A and anti-B antibodies to be in the patient's plasma. Unexpected meaning patients have been exposed to blood through transfusion or pregnancy and will develop an antibody to a minor red blood cell antigen. In the screen, we're going to take the patient's plasma and react it against two or three known reagent red blood cells who are all type O. And that's because we don't want any anti-A or anti-B interference. So what I want you to notice is that there are three different reagent red blood cells. One, two, three. And sometimes I like to call them Tom, Alex, and Harry. And these three reagent red blood cells are known donors that are type O blood group. And each one of these donors has a known red blood cell phenotype, which means that we know what antigens are expressed on their surface. So let's first take a look at Tom. Tom has a phenotype where he is positive for the big D, positive for the big C, negative for the big E, negative for the little c, positive for the big E, and etc. So wherever there's a plus sign, it means that Tom's red blood cells express those antigens. And where there's a zero, it's a negative, which means he does not express those antigens on his red blood cell surface. Whereas let's take a look at Alex. Alex has a different red blood cell phenotype. Like Tom, he also expresses the big D antigen, but he does not express the big C. He does express the big E, the little c, but he's negative for the little e, and etc. Now let's look at Harry. Harry is, has a very different phenotype. He's actually negative for the big D antigen. So he's negative for the big D, negative for the big C, negative for the big E, but positive for the little C and positive for the little E and et cetera. So what we do is we're gonna take the patient's plasma. In this case, we'll take Miss Betty's plasma and we're gonna react it. We're going to add it to both Tom, Alex, and Harry, these three donors to the red blood cells to see if she has any antibodies that bind to red blood cell antigens. And this is our, the way we grade. It's from a score of zero to four plus. Zero means no reactivity. Four plus is very high, high strength of reactivity. And you'll notice that Miss Betty's plasma does not react with any of the donor red blood cells, meaning she does not have any antibodies to antigens that are present on, this, on these screening cells. Therefore, her screen is negative. So that's easy. Betty's type is an A pause and her screen is negative. So now we can move forward and select a red blood cell that will be compatible for Miss Betty. The last point I wanted to explain to you about pre-transfusion testing is the expiration of that pre-transfusion sample. And we follow a three-day rule, which is 
that the pre-transfusion sample used for testing may be no more than three days old at the time of the intended transfusion. And we use that time period to reflect the recipient's current immunologic status. So again, let's use the example of Miss Betty and say that in the last year, she was actually transfused units of blood. She has a transplant that is scheduled for Thursday morning. It's Monday and she receives her pre-transfusion testing. Monday is actually considered day zero. And Miss Betty's pre-transfusion sample is good until Thursday evening at 11.59 p.m. But let's imagine that unfortunately, Miss Betty's surgery has to be delayed to Friday morning. That means we have to collect another pre-transfusion sample for Miss Betty's surgery to provide units of blood for her. Now, that might not be an issue because we saw earlier that Miss Betty's pre-transfusion sample, her type and screen were really straightforward. She had no discrepancies and her screen was negative. But if for some reason on Friday morning, we find an unexpected antibody or there's a discrepancy in Miss Betty's type, we would have to actually delay in providing her blood transfusion because we're gonna have to resolve the discrepancy or find special units of blood that will be compatible for her. Well, that wraps it up. Thanks so much for joining me for this PATH elective transfusion medicine module on pre-transfusion testing. I hope that you have a much better background and why pre-transfusion testing is so important for compatibility. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to reach out. You can find me on Twitter at HermelinMD. I'm going to be posting a tutorial to help consolidate the ideas that we talked about in this lecture and to extend the learning from this class. So I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.